Well, good morning and welcome to the See Me Covenant live stream. We're glad that you're here with us. Uh, this is also a f an interesting one for us because starting next week, we're going to be starting to have services actually here in person again. So um, this is an a exciting time for us, a nostalgic time for us. So if you would, wherever you're at, stand with us and uh, begin singing with worship with us with the song Mighty to Save. out everyone needs compassion and everyone needs compassion a love that's never failing let mercy fall on me and everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, and now I surrender, I surrender, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing. For the glory of the risen King, Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to sing. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing. For the glory of the risen King. You guys can take a seat. Welcome everybody. Glad to have you here. My name is Pastor Kurt and I'm glad that we are going to have a chance to worship. Thank you to our worship team who's leading us, Linda and Jay, and we're going to continue as we explore the Word and uh, pray together. I have a few announcements for us as we get started. First of all, 
Uh, we, have, uh, we have been collecting boxes for Children's Hunger Fund, and we have gotten almost, uh, right now we've gotten almost 250 boxes as of today, Wednesday, and I know that there are more coming in. If you've got boxes to bring in, or if you still want to fill a box with food, it costs somewhere around $12 to fill a box of food, go ahead and come by the office. You can pick up an empty box and a um, and a shopping list, or today is supposed to be the last day. So bring it in, <laughs> bring in your food to the office, drop it by the church at some point, and we can collect those, and we're going to send all of those to Children's Hunger Fund, and they're going to be put in the hands of needy children, kids who are food insecure around the United States, and be handed um, these boxes of food, which will bring them joy, and it's a wonderful way for us to uh, honor Christ, really, by the, the money that we give, the, the food that we're putting in people's hands in Jesus' name. Let's uh, also share your connect card. This is not the normal time that we do our uh, connect card, but uh, please fill out our digital connect card. We're going to put a link in the, um, there's a, there should be a link in the description of this video, and hopefully we can probably put one in the comments now as well, that you can uh, Click on that link and say hello. Give us your information and give us some prayer requests. Let us know what's going on for you. We'd love to stay in contact. Right now, we are in the middle of the 30 days of prayer for the Muslim world as well. So if you, maybe you got some of this information on it, that we are praying through these 30 days of prayer. And it's, it coincides with the time of Ramadan for Muslim people when they fast during daylight hours. And a lot of it is trying to connect in a deeper way with God, to please God. And we can pray that these Muslims who want in a deeper way really will find him. That we will, they will meet God, their Savior, in, the, uh, in Jesus Christ. So let's pray for that and uh, pray during this time. There's still a, a couple weeks left in Ramadan. You can pray for that. Finally, next week is going to be, we're moving inside for worship. And uh, for you, if you're staying online, it's not going to affect you that much. But it might a little bit. We're going to be switching to live streaming this, uh, this whole thing instead of recording it ahead of time. And so blooper included in <laughs> the actual event, but it may end up being that some things aren't going to work completely right, and we want to apologize ahead of time for that. Sorry. We're going to try to do our best, but in a spirit of us working together and just trying to do the best we can in difficult circumstances. I hope that you'll have some grace with that. You already have for other times when we've messed things up. Uh, but just to be forewarned, there may be a, a couple of hitches as far as we're trying to figure out the angles on things. And hopefully the live stream will work just perfectly. Um, but do pray for that. Uh, if you come here next week and everything's working great, praise God. If you have other feedback to have, we would love to hear it from you as well. Let's begin in a word of prayer as we continue in worship. Father God, today is, uh, is your day. Every day is your day. We, we turn ourselves to you. We want to be your people who, who keep our eyes focused on Jesus, who uh, weather the difficulties in our lives with the grace that comes from your Spirit working in us. May we today uh, take this moment to to worship you and see you for who you really are, to listen to your word uh, spoken, to even experience the joy of knowing that we are listening to you and worshiping you with other people who love you. Thank you for your community and thank you for this church that we can worship and serve you together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no. The found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. For 
my part in this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus And oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow But the blood of Jesus, nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other clouds I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other clouds I know. But the blood of Jesus And so oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow oh, No other clouds I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. have been so, so kind to me, and all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, please, 99, and I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away All oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God yeah. For I was your foe Still your love fought for me So, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me It's all the overwhelming Oh, we chase 
Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Holy, overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Last week we began a series looking at the study of the Sermon on the Mount and specifically the beginning few verses of that in a part called the Beatitudes. And we're going to be studying over the next few weeks this whole series. It's the whole section where Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who mourn, all of that. And that phrase is repeated nine times throughout this whole passage. And we're going to get to the bottom of what he's talking about there and what he means by this blessed life according to Jesus. One thing that strikes us right off the bat is that these things, each of these verses, that in there Jesus calls these people blessed, but these aren't naturally the people that you and I would think that we would label them as being blessed. They're poor and meek and persecuted. Then he ends up pairing each of these with a big surprising statement that is as big and surprising in its blessing as the other one was and it's surprising in that we didn't expect those to be blessed people. They are, we are given the kingdom. We are called children of God. We get to see God. Each week we're going to be taking one of these Beatitudes and, and we're going to put it in the light of another scripture that will help us to better understand what Jesus is teaching. The Beatitudes ultimately are about Christ himself. He is the perfect one who embodies the Beatitudes. And we are trying to, to learn about what this says so that we can be more like him. Let's read our passage. And I'm going to read the whole section from Matthew Again, maybe we won't do this every week, but we're getting adjusted to this whole section of the Beatitudes. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the side and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Today we're going to focus on verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And before we go further, I I think we should say a word about that specific word, blessed. The Bible that you may have in front of you there in Matthew 5, it may use a different word than blessed. Remember that the book of Matthew and the whole of the New Testament were written originally in Greek. And that Bible that you have in front of you, if it's in English or Spanish or anything else, it is a translation of that. The first word in each of these statements of the Beatitudes in Greek is makarios. And it it presents a little bit of a translation problem because any word that we have in English isn't going to quite fit exactly what that word makarios means. So, for example, we could choose a word like fortunate. Um, That gets close to the meaning, but for us in English, it kind of has a, a, it gives a feeling that there's some kind of luck involved, which is definitely not the case. Uh, others that wanting to express in some way that there is this reversal of our expectations and social norms, they use a more looser translation like honorable or esteemed, favored. Favored is the one who mourns, so they will be comforted. At any rate, we can start to see that there's, that there's a different ways to be able to approach this certain word and to try to express it, and we show that we're having some difficulty. The word that's actually probably closest to this word in Greek is our English word, happy. But it's a little bit problematic in itself, and they don't tend to use that one because when we think of happiness, we think of this emotion that can disappear pretty quickly. But a person can be makarios without actually feeling like they're happy. It's like almost like they should be happy, maybe something like that. So with that in mind, we can realize that it's actually possible for us to translate today's verse as happy are those who mourn, which sounds a little to our ears like happy are the sad. And we can say, what? What is that? As humans, we all experience loss. We, we all experience some degree of sorrow. And our deep mourning and sorrow, it, it doesn't feel like a blessing. In fact, it feels like the absence of a blessing. It's not its presence that's there. I, sorrow feels like that blessing has been taken away from us. So what's the deal? How could Jesus possibly say that a mourning person is blessed? That idea isn't completely foreign to Scripture, though. There are plenty of psalms that speak about this kind of blessing in pain. For example, Psalm 34 says this, Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. It's the image of God coming close to somebody who's mourning, somebody who's brokenhearted and crushed. It's a comfort to us to know that when we are in sorrow, that whatever that sorrow might be that we're facing, that, that whether it's a loss of a job or a difficulty in our marriage, having a friend that we love move away, or even if we've experienced some soul-shattering tragedy, we know that God is close to us in those moments. Then in Psalm 51, this is uh, David's famous psalm, crying for mercy. It's the one that we're going to read a little bit in a moment. It says this, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. We can see here that we're moving away from maybe uh, an an application where our sorrows, something that could apply to any of our sorrows, and it's more now something that looks like having our heart broken over the same things that break God's heart. How a person who is like that, then that it says God's not going to turn away from somebody whose heart breaks for the right things. Or to use the term from here, Psalm 51, God will not despise. And from the context of our passage in Matthew 5, we can understand that God isn't talking primarily about those who have lost or mourned a loved one. That's a terrible and deep wound. 
But here we have a different kind of mourning. Everyone has sorrow. But Christian mourning is rooted in the sorrow of a broken or lost shalom. The world was created to be a world in peace. Shalom, and that Hebrew word shalom, it means peace and safety, wholeness. It means everything is in its place. Things are as they are supposed to be. But what we see is that there has been a, a, a vandalism of shalom. I don't know if you have ever been burglarized. I hope that you have not. But uh, it is unsettling. It's unsettling to come home and find that your door has been kicked in or that your things have been rifled through and thrown around. Uh, things that we care about. It's our peace and safety feels like it's been broken and shattered. And, and really, it's, it's pretty hard to recover from. And you kind of, sometimes you never really recover from it because your shalom, your peace, has been vandalized. And the, the truth is, we wouldn't need to mourn ever about the theft of heir, heirloom jewelry or uh, of, of loved other objects if there was no such thing as theft in the world. So ultimately, all the mourning that we feel is connected to the fact that there is brokenness in the world. There's sin in the world. Death, poverty, all types of brokenness, all of them are connected to, ultimately to our alienation from God. And they all entered the world through and continue to be perpetuated by this brokenness, this sin. So we mourn because there's sin in the world. We, we mourn because the world was created for shalom, but the shalom has been violated. And it boils down to this. That the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Pain and violence, injustice, racism, poverty, crime, bad hamburgers, whatever. The, you know, the police and the courts are never going to run out of business because the world is not the way it's supposed to be. And I'll tell you, the global church is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, the New Testament picture of the church is of us being Christ's bride, and it doesn't always look like that. There are too many scandals in the news for us to believe that. This church, Simi Covenant Church, is not what it's supposed to be. Uh, I, can, I, can feel, I don't always feel confident giving a lot of promises and uh, promising to deliver on very many things, but this thing I can promise you that if you are around long enough and if you get close enough, at some point, we will let you down. You will be disappointed at some point. This church is made up of broken people and it is not everything that it's supposed to be. We demonstrate the brokenness of the world. My friends are not as they are supposed to be. I, they are nice people, but I have gotten close enough to know that they need a savior. <laughs> I am not everything I am supposed to be because of what things have happened to me, things that I have done. I demonstrate a violation of shalom. And, and we know that this kind of thing is going to keep on happening. It's not going to stop. And we, we mourn that. We're kind of used to it, we got to admit. And that's not good either. Uh, Cornelius Plantiga sums it up well. He says this, Even when it's familiar, sin is never normal. Sin is disruption of created harmony and then resistance to divine restoration of that harmony, the shalom. Above all, sin disrupts and resists the vital human relation to God. And it does all this disrupting and resisting in a number of intertwined ways. I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is a vast chasm, chasm between something saying, this stinks, and oh no, that's too bad, and this is not what it's supposed to be. Not just this stinks, but this is what it's supposed to be. Because anyone can live on that side to say, you know, a lot of have spent our lives basically in the realm of this stinks or oh no, and it's never been deeper than that. 
But, but God is calling us to something deeper, something more courageous. He's calling us to move into courageous mourning. And we can only actually say this is not the way it's supposed to be if we recognize that we live in a universe with a good God who made things whole, who made it in shalom. Mourning, then, is to begin to see the world in the light of that broken shalom. So all of our excuses, our com complaints, our regrets, our pains, we can hold all of those things in the light of living in a universe with a good God. And the right response to the tragedy of a vandalized shalom is mourning. So if you and I are going to press through then and to get to that difficult spot and get through all of the superficiality and all of our excuses and all of our defenses to actually begin to mourn, then we're going to mourn that sin in our lives and the sin in the world, then God is going to give us a blessing. There's a blessing that's promised, and it's Christ's comfort. And we see Paul doing just this in Romans 7. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Romans 7. We're going to look near the end, beginning in verse 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner be in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me th through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is seeing this vand vandalism of shalom in himself. And, and as he does this, as he explores this, he avoids two mistakes that, uh, uh, that allow him actually to make it to his true destination. The first mistake that he avoids is that he doesn't point the finger at somebody else. Uh, when, when our neighbors around us, they hear the word sin, Oftentimes these days, I think they kind of imagine like an old man sitting on his porch yelling at people going by, like kind of yelling at the world. <laughs> but one of the surprising parts in this passage is that, that Paul isn't on his porch yelling. No, he's, he's turned the microscope on himself. In fact, this whole passage is about Paul's own personal struggle with seeing these two things in himself. So we begin with ourselves. I can say, I am sinful. I have this war going on within me, and, and I mourn that. Now, look at the personal turmoil that Paul's in. He, he, he senses, he desires to do what's right, but he always feels this pull of sin. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So even the, the good things that he does do, he recognizes that they can be spoiled by this thing that's in him. I think a lot of us have felt this tug in ourselves to want to do what's good, but not being able to get there. Whether it's for something really simple like, hey, I want to stay on this diet or to do this new exercise uh, system that I'm doing, or something much bigger. I want to be someone who is good and righteous. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that you and I, we need to start to look at ourselves and start to just think that we are so bad. I think a lot of us are already pretty, good, pretty professional at criticizing ourselves. Now, I'm not saying you need to start to double down on that. What I'm saying, I'm not saying you need to be more critical of yourself. What I am saying is that when we recognize even things like an overly critical view of ourselves, we can begin to mourn that and say, that's part of the brokenness. I don't see myself as a child of God. Well, the second mistake that Paul avoids is he doesn't try to wiggle out of this. He doesn't try to avoid it. Paul, he looks at his own actions and motivations, and, and he, he doesn't try to escape from the harsh truth. He's seeing this and gets, he, doesn't, he says, this isn't just a superficial problem. But that's not the normal way that you and I do this, right? Usually our response when we see things in ourselves that aren't good is to, to react in much less cre uh, constructive kinds of ways. We, we feel compelled to complain, explain, or retrain. <laughs> we, we like to complain. Like, oh, these people. Who are these people? I'm outraged. 
I can't believe that there are such people. I can't believe them. <laughs> so we, we complain. Or we explain, especially if it's more about ourselves. We've got a lot of good reasons for why uh, we did this. You know, it was normal for me to have done this thing because uh, everyone would expect me to do that. Or, or even explaining could be comparing ourselves to somebody else. Well, let me explain. I'm not as bad as this other person. It's, this is how it is. Or we feel compelled to retrain that we say, you know what, what is really necessary is just to learn to do this a bit better. That's the problem. The problem was I just didn't know. So our, our knee-jerk reaction is for us to complain, explain, retrain. Uh, but all of those things are just ways to try to protect ourselves from actually engaging in real mourning. Mourning remembers the tragedy of vandalized shalom. Because when we, when we complain, we're saying, hey, I could have done that better than that person. Like the, pro- like, the personal, like the problem was personal. Or when we explain, we could have said, hey, no one could have done that any better than what happened there. The problem was situational. It's just the situation that was there. When we, when we aim to just retrain, we see the problem as mostly informational. Oh, if we'd have just had a bit more information, there wouldn't have been this problem. But instead of trying to wiggle out of it, Paul is courageous in facing the terrible reality that's there. He's, it's probably one of the most frightening things we can do, actually, is to come to grips, to come to look at our own mangled self. And complaining, explaining, and retraining are all, in the end, just really pretty evasive or more empty. And it starts, I'm starting to think maybe mourning our sin is actually one, the only really 100% way for us to engage in an honest way. And that's what Paul does. He, he takes the evidence of what's going on in his life and he uses this very vibrant language of war, of feeling powerless, of being this divided soul. For I see in my inner being, verse 22, that I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. He's, he's seeing this terrible vandalism shalom in himself. And instead of making excuses, Paul mourns. Look at verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And because he mourns, instead of making excuses he ends up getting comforted. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then uh, just after that, in uh, chapter 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because those Christ Je- through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So previously he saw himself as a prisoner and now he has been set free. He was at war and now there's peace He gets comforted on a deep level because he engaged with God on a deep level in his mourning, not on just the surface. If if we engage with God just on the surface level, we may just get some kind of surface level comfort. But he engages God deeply and gets a profound comfort. It's a comfort that's connected with his deliverance by Jesus Christ. It comes from the fact that God himself entered into our world in the person of Christ. The comfort that God offers then comes at the price of his willingness to come, to to become a man, to die in our place, and to do that for our healing and our wholeness, to restore shalom, and he did it at the price of the cross. Our mourning is is a reflection of our recognition of the cost of broken shalom. Our mourning is a reflection of our recognition of the cost of broken shalom. But to look at God, we can look at God's comfort as well. It's huge. God's welcoming embrace ends up reaching down into our darkest places. And I want to tell you that you will, you can only be free if you are willing to let God into the deepest, darkest places of your life. The places where, like Paul, 
you feel powerless and like a prisoner. Where you, the places where you feel like you're at war, the places where you feel divided and, and you're separated from yourself and your soul, where you don't know how you're going to get out of it and you don't know what to do. And there's no way that we would ever welcome just anybody into that kind of place. It's, it's too tender. But we can welcome the one who said, I died for you. And specifically, so you can be healed even to those places. My healing can reach into the deepest crevices of your shattered shalom. I didn't die just to paper over issues or just to make you feel good or have warm feelings. Christ died for us so that we can be healed to our inmost being. Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he delivers us so that we won't be prisoners of our misunderstandings, of our sorrows, of something that has been done to us or something that we have done. And those things can be terrible and they come at the price of the vandalism of shalom and at the price of Christ's death for us. And Paul, what does he do? He looks at himself and instead of pointing the finger at somebody else or, or trying to wiggle out of it or complaining, explaining, or retraining, instead he mourned. And he was blessed because he mourned. His mourning resulted in comfort. I wonder what this would look like in a different kind of scenario. Uh, I read a post last year by writer Anne Lamott, and she never mentions blessed are those who mourn or this passage in Romans 7 in her article, but I, I see in her this principle of blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Lamont tells us that she once sent a blisteringly snarky email about a coworker and accidentally sent that email about that coworker to that coworker. <laughs> this is the nightmare scenario. It's terrible. And you know, a lot of us I, you know, you don't mind if somebody has an, an idea that you are probably a sinful person or that you do things wrong, but it's certainly more uncomfortable when we give them actual evidence to prove that. <laughs> Tell me if you recognize any of her progression in some way that you would respond. She mentions that her first reaction was to try to explain it away. It was because she was having a hard week. She says this, I was a mess. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> she was falling into one of those first mistakes, but I appreciate her honesty as it follows. She says, except that excuses aren't enough. If transformation is going to come, this will include both the deep dive into miserable truths and a radical di dive into forgiveness. Neither of which, she says, she does very naturally. A, a deep dive into miserable truths. That sounds to me like mourning. And she says, a radical dive into forgiveness. That sounds like comfort. So her second response then, when she kind of gathers herself, is to pray. And her prayer was really simple. She said to God, help! And she saw that she couldn't fix it, and she put her trust in God. I need to turn to God. And if you were here last week, you might recognize some of, in that statement of going to God, she looks, sounds like she's poor in spirit. We said, blessed are the poor in spirit. These are the people who recognize that they need to ask God, God who gives graciously of his riches to us. She's poor in spirit in the good sense of this. But moving toward God is not the end of it. Lamont, she had the presence of mind to notice her own attitude in prayer. And she says this, I tried to pray, but it was not as a supplicant, not as somebody actually asking for something from God. I just wanted to feel better. And as she prays, she, she sees her mixed emotions. And she reminds me of Paul. He says, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Even in praying, she recognized, I have kind of some mixed motives. And here is where the deep work can start to begin. See, she knew that she just had wanted to feel better. She hadn't actually begun to mourn her own sinfulness. 
She mentions, she says, she says, you know, like most other people, I don't like to look at my interior because when I occasionally get the courage to look at it or accidentally get forced to see myself, it's not pretty. And this is what she says. I eventually take a peek. Eesh! Ick! Marbled into my basic decency and good-heartedness, I see the rats and worms under my psyche's woodpile. I see my narcissism, my racism, and Lamott. She, she is describing the war that Paul talked about in Romans 7. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. Or just to use Lamott's bit more po- poetic language, marbled into my basic decency and good-heartedness, I see the rats and worms under my psyche's woodpile. Hey, marbling, when we are talking about a good cut of meat, marbling equals deliciousness, wonderful yumminess. But the marbling of sin in our lives is bitter, and it spoils everything. It spoils the recipe of our lives. And when we get a taste of this, we mourn its foul presence because it spoils things. We mourn the sin in the world. We mourn sin in our lives because it represents the loss of our innocence, of our righteousness, of our self-respect. The the right response to the vandalism of shalom is to move beyond just, oh no, and oh, that's too bad, that stinks, and get to this sorrow of repentance. Repentance. Lamont turns to God finally, and she's comforted. She says that she turned to God to ask for help, and she says that when we do that, that's the prayer. To ask for God for help is the prayer of the miserable and scared and very stuck. Sounds like somebody who needs to mourn. Who still, against all odds, believe that we can be changed and freed. That's hopeful. And, And Romans tells us that we can be changed and freed. Verse 24, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We remember that the Beatitudes that Jesus is painting here, it's a portrait of the life of a disciple, somebody who turns to God and wants to be changed, this lifelong discipleship. And a disciple who mourns starts with acknowledging their poverty before God. I need God to give to me. But, and then it also mourns the brokenness in the world and in me. But I have great news. You know what? Mourning is temporary. It's temporary because Christ is going to wipe away every tear. This world is going to be remade. And we won't have to keep on mourning forever because permanent comfort is coming. Now, even the comfort that we have of life in Christ with the Spirit in us is, is, is small compared to the comfort that we're going to be having ahead. So if you long for something more, if you know that things aren't right, when you sense that there's this vandalism of shalom, then we can, we can mourn and long for that shalom to be restored. We mourn because we needed and still need Good Friday. We, we needed the cross. We needed somebody to deliver us, to save us. And even in our mourning, though we know that Easter is coming that it follows and it transformed what was a dark Friday to be for us a good Friday. All right, so how are you supposed to apply this? Let me tell you, in this week ahead, in this month ahead, in this year ahead, you are going to see evidence of sin and brokenness. It's going to be the vandalism of shalom and you're going to see it in the world, you're going to see it in the global church, you're going to see it in our church. You're going to see it in your friends, and you're going to see it in yourselves. And if you don't see it, I think you might not be looking because it's there. And when we do, we are going to feel this rising up in us, this desire to use some of these avoidance techniques, to think that my solution is going to be to complain. Ah, just I, want to, I don't want this thing. Or to explain, oh, it's all understandable. Or maybe just what we need is to retrain. We need to learn more and get better. What Jesus wants us to know is that the problem is in our heart and it's due to the brokenness in us and in the world. And what we need to do is to begin 
by morning. Something you're going to see in the news this week or this month is going to, how, what is your response going to be? Can you mourn? Something you see in your life that's broken, can you mourn? And when we do that, we're going to be driven to the only real hope that's possible. What a wretched person I am. What a wretched world this is. Who will rescue us from the body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is why people are blessed if they mourn, because they will be comforted in Christ. Let's pray. We turn to you, our Lord. You're the one who, who comforts us in our mourning. And you, you're the one that, that helps us to realize really how deep the problem is. But you knew how deep it was. And so we, we welcome your work in us. Boy, things are not the way they're supposed to be. And that's why it's so amazing that you are working in me. Wow, that you have hope in me. Hope in all these people in you. May our lives reflect that amazing transformation. Not only in, in what we do day to day, but even in our hope for how people can know you and love you and be changed by your work in their lives. We pray in your name. Amen. Uh, well, Kurt, thank you for that message. And now as we, as a community, really respond to that message, we're going to step into our time of offering. So we'll have the links up on the screen for if you'd like to give with us. Uh, and then I would encourage you to think about, as we sing this next song, really let Kurt's words sink in. Uh, reflect on those and think about what it means for us to really step into as a community uh, that, that sense of really looking at ourselves and walking in humility and, um, and seeing the, the freedom that actually comes with that. So we're going to sing this song, Give Us Clean Hands. Um, and so if you would like to give with us uh, online, you can. Uh, or if you'd like to be thinking of ways that you can make really giving a part of your life through your skill sets, through your uh, social circles, through your community and, the, and the, um, the things that you bring to the table, essentially. Uh, think about ways this week that you can be giving of yourself um, to the people around us and to the community around us. Sing, we bow our hearts. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols, so give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. No oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh God. Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God, Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us 
does not lift our souls to another, no God let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob, no God let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Not out again. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. No God, let us be. A generation that seeks, seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. No oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Now, wherever you are, if you'd stand with us as we sing this last song together. And to him I, the highest king, would welcome me. And I was lost, but he brought me in with his love for me. Oh, his love for me to the sun sets free oh it's free indeed i'm a child of god yes i am and free at last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. To the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. It's in my Father house there's a place for me i'm a child of god yes i am i am chosen not forsaken i am who you say i am you are for me not against me i am who you say i am I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. And you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. To the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. And in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. And I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not 
not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. All right, everyone, last, this is our last recorded ahead of time thing for a while, we think, and I want to send you off with a blessing. May you this week have the blessing of mourning, that you will mourn the things that are, uh, that's the vandalism of shalom that's broken, that you can take those things to God and to have God's comfort that he gave us Christ Jesus. May you be comforted by God, who cares about what happens in our world and in your life. And may you be healed by it, I pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week. And then at some point, too, uh, well, let's not forget to have the spot where you run off stage to go get water. <laughs>